Thank you for that, Brother Mike. If you have your Bibles tonight, we'll take them and go together to the book of Judges, chapter number 3. Judges, chapter number 3. And of course, a song that he just sang is in our hymn book. It's found in our hymn book. It's called My Savior, First of All, or I Shall Know Him. And uh, written by Fanny Crosby. And of course, many of you know Fanny's story that um, as a young girl, uh, before she was old enough to realize anything, she contracted a, a sickness that led to her blindness. And, um, and throughout her life, as folks would try to feel sorry for her, uh, she, would, she would tell them, she said, don't feel sorry for me, uh, because the first thing that I'm going to see is my Savior, first of all, my Savior, first of all. And that was the basis through which, um, to, through which she wrote that song, which is certainly a very precious thought. Well, we're in Judges chapter number three tonight, and uh, we have um, begun here this year on the Wednesday nights that I've had an opportunity to preach, a study here in the book of Judges. And I, I do think that there's um, some very, very applicable things here. And if you've missed any of that, you can, you can go on to the various uh, platforms that our church has uh, messages posted, uh, whether it be the church app or our YouTube page or sermonaudio.com, any number of places, and you can find uh, the previous messages. And we've tried to lay uh, the groundwork to, to, to what has been happening. And tonight we're going to get to the very first judge that is mentioned. We learn of him in Judges chapter number 3. And uh, we're going to, again, look at um, what precipitated uh, his, uh, his leadership and his ministry and, uh, and how God used him. And so I want you to take your Bibles, and again, you're in Judges chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. We'll read down through verse number 11. All right? The Bible says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgat the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Shushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Shushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Shushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Shushan Rishathaim. I'm glad I don't have to read that anymore. <laughs> Verse 11. And the land had rest 40 years. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So we see here this first judge that God raises up amongst the children of Israel. And a uh, very simple title as we study his life and his ministry and, and his leadership. And we've just simply titled tonight's message, Othniel, the first judge. Othniel, the first judge. Now we have again shared with you um, some background over the previous Wednesdays that we've been together here in 2018. And I'll, I'll do my best to maybe bring up to speed, and I think the passage does some of that as well, those of you that may not have been here for those messages. But the Bible is clear that the book of Judges comes on the heels of the book of Joshua. And, uh, and, and we, we, we find that when Joshua passes off the scene, there is a void, a vacuum of leadership. Uh, to which, in the very beginning of Judges chapter number 1, uh, the people of God cry out after the death of Joshua, Lord, who is going to lead us? Who is going to, who is going to take us forward? What, 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 what are we going to do? There, there was not a, a set man that had, been, uh, that had been groomed by Joshua, that had been trained, and had been appointed by God and anointed by God to lead the people. And, uh, and, and so God had a plan, as he always does, God instructed them that the tribe of Judah was going to lead the people. And so this is different. This is not how things have been. 
Uh, the children of Israel have been led out of the, the land of Egypt by Moses, uh, the great leader, the great prophet, the great lawgiver. And after Moses passes off the scene, immediately uh, the Bible says that the Spirit descended upon Joshua and that he took up that, uh, that, that mantle of leadership and he led the people across the Jordan and into the promised land and into conquering <clears throat> the promised land. And yet when Joshua dies, there is, there is no leader. And so the first two chapters kind of deal with uh, how that looks and, and, and how that works. And the Bible is clear uh, that the children of Israel uh, were, were not completely obedient to God during this period of time. And, uh, and, and that they did not drive out all of the inhabitants as God had told them uh, to do. And we're going to find here <clears throat> that that is going to provide some problems for the people. And it is going to provide a need for a, a more specific leader than just a general tribe. And God is going to raise up several men and even a woman throughout the book of Judges to lead his people. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the background. So let's just jump right into this passage and see what we can find here in verses 1 to 11. Number one, I want us to consider, and we've already touched on this a little bit, but it's, it's given us in more specific detail in this passage, the conditions that necessitated a judge the conditions that necessitated a judge or a deliverer. And again, for those of you that, that uh, are, are into this sort of thing, the notes can be found on the church's app, and you can follow along there and, and uh, utilize that it just as, as a reminder. So the conditions that necessitated a judge. Why was a judge necessary or a deliverer? We find that in verses 1 through 8. And, and we'll start here with verses 1 to 3. We see the presence of trouble. The presence of trouble. In verse number one through verse number three, we find uh, that God, <clears throat> God tells us some specific things that are a little unusual. Uh, notice the Bible says, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel <coughs> excuse me, by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. As we said just a moment ago, Israel had failed to do what God had initially told them to do in Deuteronomy chapter 7. In verses 1 to 5. We've already referenced that a couple of times on our Wednesday nights together, and so we won't turn there again. But we'll find that God had given them very, very specific instructions of what they were to do when they entered into the promised land. That they were to drive out all of the inhabitants. That they were not to spare anyone whatsoever. And there was a reason why God had led them to do this. The Bible talks about the iniquity of the Canaanites and that God had given them space to repent. And we're not talking about just a short period of time. We're talking about centuries in which God had been faithful in, 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 uh, in giving them opportunities to turn from their wickedness and their sin. We're talking about a group of people that, uh, that, that uh, were, were, uh, uh, were morally uh, wicked and, uh, and, and, and backslidden. Uh, we're talking about people that, uh, that, that, that did not hesitate to offer human sacrifices to appease gods. Uh, so we're talking about a group of people that were absolutely and totally wicked and, uh, and, and with very little thought or concern for anyone but themselves. And, uh, and, and so, and so this, this new generation that's coming onto the scene here in Joshua chapter number three, uh, is, is they're, they're coming into leadership positions. And as they're coming up, they're looking around them and they're seeing, hey, uh, it's not just us here in this land, but there's also these other people groups. There are Canaanites that, that are here. And uh, boy, that, that, that could lead to some, some problems and some issues. And so we see here the presence of trouble. But I want you to notice that God is capable of even using the mistakes that we make to accomplish his purpose. I, I, find, I, find, I find great comfort in this truth because I make a lot of mistakes. And to think that God is able to even, to even turn around the messes that I make in life and to still accomplish a purpose provides great comfort for me as a human being, as an individual. And so look what, look what God's purpose is. And God says, okay, well, since you didn't drive them out, well then, okay, we'll leave them here, and here's what they're going to accomplish. And we're going to leave them to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. And so here's what, here's what God does. With the remaining nations, they provide a presence of trouble there comes with that also a heightened sense of preparation for battle. 
In other words, uh, these, these young men and, and these, even some of these middle-aged men, they knew very little of war and of conquest, of strength, of going to battle. And, uh, and, and if, there was, if there was absolutely no um, Canaanites and Hivites and Jebusites in the land, uh, then the people of God no doubt would have per- perhaps grown very, grown very complacent and very lazy during this period. And so God says, all right, their presence here is going to keep you on your toes. It is going to keep you uh, aware of the fact that you are not alone and that at any point, at any time, you could have trouble, you could have a problem. And you say, does this make any sense? And does God still work this way today? Can I tell you that perhaps some of you, you come to this service tonight and you have what is commonly known or referred to as a thorn in the flesh. And in your mind, if you were God, you're thinking to yourself, if I was God, I would remove this from, what, from, from, my, from my, my life and from what I have to deal with. Because it causes me nothing but problems and issues and trouble. It just doesn't make any sense that this thing is allowed to hang on. I don't know what it is. I, I can't, I won't even speculate what that might be in your life. But as you look at it, you'd say, this, this trouble is, it's just constantly there. I can never, I can never grow completely comfortable and completely at ease because this thing is always in my rear view. And I'm here to tell you that perhaps maybe God doesn't want you to grow completely comfortable. Maybe God doesn't want you to be completely at ease or relaxed. Maybe God is using this, this thing, this, this presence, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a mistake that you made. Maybe it's some health issue that you have that really has nothing to do with you or any decision or choice that you've made. And you've gone to God like Paul did, and you've asked him over and over again, God, would you remove this thing from my life? Would you remove its presence from my life? I don't understand its purpose. And perhaps maybe God has said, no, I'm going to allow that to remain. Because if I took that away, you would fall into a state of complacency. You you would lose the strength that I want you to have because the presence of this thing, it builds something in your life that you would not have otherwise. That's exactly what God is doing here. The remaining nations were intended by the devil to produce weakness, and, and, and they will. We'll see that. But God had a far different plan. God's plan was that these nations were intended to produce strength. That the, that the, the people of God, that they, would, uh, that they would be prepared for battle at any moment, realizing <clears throat> we can't let our guard down. Not with these people living in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and living around here. No, no, we, we, we must be ready for war at any point in time. We must be prepared for the battle. So we see here the conditions and necessity. The judge begins with the presence of of trouble, but notice we see here that God has uh, this idea of the proof of faithfulness found in verse number four. Would you look? It says, and they were these nations. They were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which He commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. God not only not only wanted these nations uh, in their presence to keep the children of Israel on guard and prepared at all times and, and at maximum strength and, and, and capacity and ability. But God also had another uh, intended desire in, in allowing these nations to live all around the children of Israel. And because they would not drive them out, this is, uh, this is part of what they would have to deal with. And so God says, well, if, it's gonna, if you're going to have to deal with it, I'm going to use it. And he does. And, and the second way in which he intends to use it would be that it would prove whether or not God's people would remain faithful to him and do the right thing in spite of the presence of trouble and the presence of these people. You, you see, these people would be a proving ground for the people of God. With them around, with their presence around, will, will my people, will they, will they stand strong and will they remain firm in their convictions and the things that they're supposed to do? Or are they going to allow these others to, to, to drag them down and, and, to, uh, and, and to make them that which they ought not to be? And so again, we see that God left these other nations to just demonstrate whether or not his people would remain faithful or loyal to him. Now you know how it is when you have, when you have a weight that doth so easily beset you, as the Bible talks about in Hebrews chapter number 12. You know that 
that when you, when you get victory over that weight, whatever it may be, boy, that provides confidence and strength, doesn't it? Boy, we, we, just, we just rejoice when, uh, when, when we're able through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God to overcome that thing, even if it's just temporary. Man, how that, how that boosts us forward. And uh, man, I, I feel so much stronger and so much better about my Christian life than when I'm able to say no to the, to the weight and the, and the sin that doth so easily beset me. And God's intention was that every day God's people would get up and, and they would realize, okay, these people are not like us. And so we're to keep our distance from them. We are to live in our lives in such a way that is pleasing to God. Uh, that we, uh, that, that we re- resist some of the temptations that they might seek to bring into our lives. Uh, we, we, we cannot allow ourselves to fall uh, to their devices and to the things that they're trying to do. And with every passing day that they would live that way, it would build more and more strength. And they would look back and they would say, look at, look at, look at what we've done through the power of God. God has given us victory. And I believe God even intended for the children of Israel to live in such a way that these other nations that were living around them would say, there's something different about these people. And that was God's plan all along. And that their presence would, would prove the faithfulness of God's people. And I'm here to tell you that very sadly, as we're going to look here in just a moment, the nation of Israel failed this test badly. They did not pass the test of faithfulness. They did not prove themselves faithful uh, through, their, through their lives and through resisting the presence of the enemy that was around them. We see that as we come Thirdly, here to the problems that ensued in verses 6 and 7. We see, first of all, in verse number 6, we learn of unhealthy relationships. Unhealthy relationships. Look in verse number 6. The Bible says, And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. The children of Israel intermingled with and eventually allowed their daughters to marry Canaanite husbands and they allowed their sons to marry Canaanite wives. He says, is this a big deal? This is a very big deal. And we see that it's a big deal in the verses that follow. And can I tell you, it's still a big deal today. We, we, we don't, as, far as, as far as we know, <clears throat> there's no Canaanites or very few Canaanites living here in the United States of America or descendants of the Canaanites. The Canaanites would simply be re- re- represented by the world, those that are, that are lost and do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We find that the New Testament expressly condemns and forbids relationships of this sort between the saved and the lost, or between God's children and those who are not God's children. The Bible is very clear in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 14, warning against being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I think we perhaps find that it's the most dangerous when it, is, uh, when it, is, it comes to the marital relationship. When you have a, a saved young man who decides that he is going to date an unsaved young lady, and eventually uh, they come to a marriage altar, or the, an unsaved young lady, think, or saved young lady thinking she's going to date an unsaved man, and that she's going to be a positive influence and impact upon him, that very rarely happens. Usually the opposite takes place. Usually uh, the unsaved individual drags down the saved individual. And you wouldn't think that that would be the case. And we would sit here and we'd say, no, I'm stronger than that. I'm better than that. But in almost every instance that, that, that we can point to, we can say it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You say, well, why doesn't it work? Well, there are probably a lot of reasons, but can I say first and foremost, it doesn't work because it is a clear violation of Scripture. And if you go against what the Bible has to say, you might as well, you might as well count on, on failure. You might as well count on problems and on issues. When the Bible is very clear about something, when the Bible says, hey, don't do this, and it gives us examples like it does here in Judges chapter number three, and we sit here and we say, well, I'm strong enough to handle it. I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to be better than that. And you, you mark it down. You are going to have issues and you are going to have problems. And that's exactly what happens here. That the, the, uh, the Canaanites, they, they dragged down the, the children of Israel. And the Bible says at the end of verse number six, and they served their gods. And that word gods there is not capitalized. 
So it's not talking about the Canaanites serving the God of Israel, but rather it's talking about the children of Israel, the children of God serving the gods of the Canaanites. And so we see here unhealthy relationships. But thirdly, we, secondly, we see unbelievable behavior in verse number seven. Notice what the Bible says. It says, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. We see, first of all, evil acts. The Bible doesn't get real specific on just what these acts were. We don't, we don't have a, a, a specific list here, but it just says they did evil. I suppose you can let your imagination wander, but we can just suffice it to say that uh, whatever they were doing was sinful and it was wicked in the sight of God. The Bible also says not only evil acts, but they had a short memory. Look what it says. It says, and forget the Lord their God. They had, uh, they had memory issues, amnesia, so to speak, when it came to God and their relationship with him. They forgot all about him as they worshiped these other gods. And then finally, we see here blatant idolatry. And the reference here to Balaam in verse 7 is a reference to many different Baals or places where you could worship Baal. According to Dr. David Sorensen, uh, he says this, these usually were idols of calves or young bulls which were erected in groves of trees, usually upon hilltops. If you read through 1st, uh, 2nd Samuel and 1st uh, and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you'll find over and over again uh, that God says about certain kings uh, that they, they did not destroy the high places and they did not destroy the groves. Well, that's what's, that's what's being spoken of here. Uh, these places, they would build these altars in these high places because they believed that it would get them closer to, to God who would be in heaven. Not the God of the Bible, <clears throat> but the God of their own making. Of the God of these false gods, the God of Baal. Imagine, imagine bowing in front of a, in front of a statue. We, we, it's that silly. That's, that's ridiculous. Who would do something like that? Well, I want you to know something. Millions and millions of souls down through history have bowed in front of statues. It's happening today in other parts of our world uh, that uh, there's, something, there's something in human nature uh, that, that, that wants to be able to, to see something, to hold something. They want uh, for, for it to be something that they could grab a hold of and this idea of faith. And, and, and God says this, God says that without faith, it is impossible to please me. And so we have a world of people that are worshiping false gods and false idols. And, and, and God says, you, you, you've missed the whole point. That I'm a God not made of hands. That I'm a God that is a spirit. You can't see me. You can't touch me. Uh, you can't necessarily hear me with your ears, but you can, uh, you can still experience me. And if you're going to worship me, you cannot worship me with a physical presence and a physical form, but you must worship me in spirit and in truth. And that's what's going on here. The Bible tells us that these, these people were worshiping Balaam and David Sorensen said this at the very end of this paragraph. He says, it was a most vile form of sexually depraved worship. In other words, it was, uh, it was, it was wicked and it was immoral. I shared, I think, with you uh, that not long ago, again, I was in Israel, and we went to the town of Megiddo. And they took us up to a platform, and they had us look down into a, a, a valley full of ruins. And they said, you see, that, you see that round structure made out of stones, made out of rocks? And they said, yeah, we see it. It was pretty good size. It was probably 20, 25 feet. And they said when they unearthed that many years ago, immediately the archaeologists knew what it was. And they said they knew immediately that it was an altar. It was a Canaanite altar. And the reason why they knew what it was is because they found on that altar human remains. And these, uh, these people, uh, these Canaanites, they, uh, they, they would literally, they would offer their children, they would offer human beings as sacrifices to these gods. And we would say, well, that's the, that's the, the world, that's the, the flesh, those, those are wicked people. But we find in Judges chapter 3, because they would not distance themselves, they would not separate themselves, we find God's people doing the exact same things. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable behavior found here in this passage of Scripture. Can I show you, fourthly, as we consider what necessitated a, a judge or a deliverer we see the price of sin in verse number eight. The Bible says this, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Shushan Rishathan, 
king of Mesopotamia. I, uh, I got to tell you, I, I grew up as a, as a young person and we, we had structure and order in our home. And um, I, uh, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of responsibility as a little kid other than just go to school, get my homework done and stay out of trouble. And that was, that was pretty much it. I, I, lived a, I lived a pretty good life as, as just a little boy. Um, God was very good to me. I think about some, some of the things that I've heard and I've counseled with people and some of the issues that they dealt with as children. My heart breaks. My childhood was, my childhood was, pretty, was pretty special. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I also understood that there was, there was a fear that had been put in my heart of my father and of my mother to a lesser extent but I realized if I offended her, then I offended him. And so, you know, it, it, was, it was the same thing. And so, and, and so but there were, there, were time, there were times in which, man, he, he uh, boy, you know, he was, he was hot about something that I had done. And I, and I knew it. I, I remember one night, my parents, I, I suppose maybe I've told you this story before, but my parents had been out, I think they were making some visits. They were visiting some folks in our church and, and we had stayed home as boys and and uh, while they were gone, we had done something. The three of us had done something we weren't supposed to do. And uh, when, 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 when they came home, uh, I don't remember how they found out. Probably was my younger brother told on us. That, that would be my guess. But, uh, but they found out that we had done something that we should not have done. And uh, so my dad that night, it, it was unusual and it wasn't, it wasn't a huge deal. Uh, but he wanted us to know that what we had done was wrong. And so he said, you have two options. He said, you can either, you can either go to bed right now or you can t get a SWAT. Well, I mean, I, I love to sleep. I mean, that was, never, that was never a problem. And I thought, I'm, I'm just gonna go to bed. I, I, no big deal. I mean, it was, it was early, but it wasn't that big of a deal. And so I remember I went to bed and I remember my brothers decided they were gonna take the SWAT. They were gonna stay up later and who knows what they were gonna do. And, and I remember laying in my bed that night and, and uh, hearing, hearing, uh, hearing my dad SWAT my brothers. And they didn't cry all that much. And the SWAT didn't seem, you know, as violent as, as it normally was, you know. And, and I remember, uh, I remember my, my one brother, he came into my room and I was laying there that it was dark and he said, man, you made a bad choice. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, I don't know. I don't know what God into, but he didn't SWAT us all that hard. It wasn't that big of a deal. And I, my mind started thinking, I mean, I don't, don't want to get gypped here. I, I, I made a bad choice. I made a bad decision and my brothers, they're, they, they barely suffered any pain and barely experienced anything. And so I remember thinking, well, what do I do? And I remember I got out of my bed and I went, and, went over to my, where my dad was. I must have been downstairs. I said, hey, dad, I kind of changed my mind. I, I, I kind of like to take that swat after all. And my dad had this look on his face like, what in the world? And he must have known. He must have known. One of my brothers had told me. And, and sure enough, it was a it was, the, it was the lightest swat that I ever got in my entire life. Well, I don't remember exactly what we did, but he wasn't that hot about it. He wasn't that upset. It wasn't maybe as big of a deal. But I got to tell you, there were times in which maybe we, we, we had done something that he had warned us about over and over again, and he wanted us to learn the lesson. You are going to feel some pain here because I want you to understand what you're doing is a big deal. And the Bible says that God got angry that he was hot with his people. An, an attitude of, of, of righteous indignation, a, a spirit of furiousness. How, how dare you live this way? God's people had done the unthinkable. I, I want you to take your Bibles very quickly and go with me to Jeremiah chapter two. Jeremiah chapter number two. Now I have this passage is to be written way in the future from where we are in Judges chapter three. It expresses the mind of God. And it expresses the unbelievable behavior of God's people. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse number 9. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, and send unto Keter and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. God, you know what God's saying here? He's saying, go all around the world. Go anywhere you want to go. And look at every people group. Go to the Isles of Chittim if you want. Go to this location called Keter and take a look. Have, have those people... 
Have they ever changed their gods, which are no gods to begin with? Oh no, they won't, they won't cast off their gods. They would never do such a thing, even though they're not even gods to begin with. And yet God says, but my people, my people have changed their glory. My people have turned their back on me, the living God, the God of the universe, to serve and to worship gods that do not profit Be astonished, he says, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. God says, this is is unthinkable. They would do such a thing, and yet that's exactly what has taken place. The foolishness of God's people and doing what they had done. He says, "You, you won't find In the earth below or in the heaven above, you won't find any other group of people that has done so foolishly but my people. It angers God. The price of sin angers God. But notice, secondly, it brings bondage. It brings bondage. Going back with me to Judges chapter number 3, we find the Bible says, And he sold them, speaking of God, into the hand of Shushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. Did you know that this was the the first time God's people had been in bondage since Egypt. They had been free for all of those years. Probably 70, 75, maybe 80 years have come and gone. Maybe even more since they had tasted bondage. A whole nation of people, a whole generation had passed off the scene. And now here they are and they're right back almost to where they began. God said this was not ever how it was supposed to be. God says, I promise to protect you and I promise to watch over you and to take care of you every step of the way. I promise to fight your battles. All you had to do is believe me and follow me. The Bible tells us that the length of their bondage was eight years. Eight years. Seems like a long time, doesn't it? For a few moments of pleasure. A few maybe months of wickedness and idolatry and idol worship. Eight long, tedious, hard years in which they served this king of Mesopotamia. Can I tell you that a few moments of pleasure, a few months of wickedness, and living life any which way we want to can lead very quickly to a lifetime of heartache. And that's exactly what happens here to the children of Israel. Well, I don't think we're going to get much further than this. I had intended to get all the way to Athenai. We never even got there. I apologize. I guess we'll pick this back up the next time that we're together. But I want us again to consider here the, the condition in Israel that necessitated a judge and a deliverer. And I want you to look at your own life. I want me, all of us, let's look at our own lives. How, how, how are we doing? I think about, again, this idea of the presence of trouble. And sometimes we're so quick to... To get out of the messes. Maybe, maybe God is speaking to us tonight and God is saying, no, listen, we're going to leave this here for a little while because its presence is going to make you stronger. We would never think that way. We would never see it that way, but that's exactly what God says here in Judges chapter 3. I'm not going to remove you from this crucible of pain and suffering just yet. I'm going to allow these nations to remain here so that, so that you can be always on guard and vigilant and prepared and strong and ready for war should it come. I'm going to leave this here because I want, to, I want it to serve as proof, proof of your faithfulness. And every day you get up and you overcome that, that weight or that sin that does so easily beset you. And you experience victory day by day by day. And every day you get stronger and you get better and you get closer to me. And you walk in my will. These are good things. These are blessed things. But then we consider that the problems that ensued as a result of their their wickedness, their unhealthy relationships, and their unbelievable behavior. And then lastly, again, we consider the price of sin. The old songwriter said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it'll leave you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's so very true. God, help us to see that. God, help us to be reminded of our sin and what it leads to before we jump headlong into it. May God help us if we consider these things. Would you bow your-